I'm really excited about the word that God's going to share with us today. So before we dive in, let's just open with a word with a word of prayer. All right. Let's just center our hearts, center our minds. I don't know what you got going on at home or wherever you're watching, but if you could just take a moment to be still and just breathe in. And uh, let's just go before the Lord in prayer. God, we honor you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you recognition and honor. Lord, you are the self-existent one, which means you not depending on anyone or anybody to exist, or you're not depending on anything for your well-being. God, you are self-existent and we worship you. You don't need anybody, <laughs> but yet you choose to show your love towards us. God, we give you glory. God, we just wanna pray that you would bless our time together Lord, that you would breathe into this word and that you would just have your way, that you would shift things in our hearts and our minds, that we might give you all the glory. I ask for your anointing to make preaching and teaching easy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, family. How you doing? Y'all having a, a good Sunday? I'm so glad to be here with you. We're just going to dive right in. And I want to start by reading the passage. It's our lectionary passage today. I want to just start off with reading the passage. It's so rich. Um, I'm coming from 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 17. Now, 2 Corinthians 2 through 6 are like some of my favorite Bible chapters Ever. So I'm just so excited to bring this to you. So let's just start with 2 Corinthians 5. I'm picking up at verse 11. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Feel free to follow along or you could just read it on the screen. It says, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere. And I hope you know this too. We are, are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so that you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died. We have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. 16 says, so we stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who believes, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. The title that we're going to talk about today is I see it differently now. I see it differently now. That's our title for today. And by way of review, man, we've been in this Pentecost season for a minute. We're still in Pentecost season in the lectionary calendar. It goes all the way to August. So it's a full summer revival, but we are still in uh, Pentecost season and we've talked about having a personal Pentecost. We've talked about hosting the presence of God. Pastor Mike brought it home for us and he talked about the importance of Pentecost and why it's so important in our everyday lives. But I have a question. I have a question for the saints. How do you know when the Holy Spirit is operating in your life? Like, how do you know? Is it when you get the goosebumps or you just feel something comes over you or you, you start crying? I mean, how do you know when the Holy Spirit is operating in you? All those things are cool. Like, it's good. Like, the goosebumps, the chill. Maybe you just start feeling something that you've never felt. Maybe it's something you really can't explain. Maybe it's something really intangible. But this is a good question. Stop and think, your, stop and think to yourself. How do I know? How do I know the Holy Spirit is operating in my life? 
You know, unfortunately, we have limited the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We've limited the Holy Spirit just to gifts. Like when we think of the Holy Spirit, we just think of gifts. We think of the gifts of the Spirit. You know, we've relegated the Holy Spirit to some spiritual Santa Claus or like this divine Oprah. Like everybody gets a gift. You get a gift. You get a gift. Like we do. All, we do all these things. This is how we just put the Holy Spirit in one category. And we just think it's all about gifts, which is good. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm here for all the expressions. Like I'm here for it. Like there's something about Jesus, there's something about the Holy Spirit. It's like fire shut up in your bones. Like when you start to feel something in your hands or in your feet, you can't. It's like fire inside of you. You can't help but to express it. And just like a, for a quick side note, we're just taking a quick side note. We're in the second Corinthians five and, and in second Corinthians five, five. Just a quick fun fact about the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to get back on on track. Quick fact is that second Corinthians five, five says that the Holy Spirit is our deposit. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee or our or, or our earnest. It's like as though God gave us a, an engagement ring while we're here on earth. Isn't that rich? Like God gave us a deposit. God gave us like a layaway saying like, you know what? Um, I'm just going to give you a little portion of what my spirit is, what my presence in life. And I'm going to cast you out when you get to heaven. You're going to get to feel the full extent of my presence. I'm just going to give you a little bit of my presence, a little foretaste. It's like I said, it's like layaway. Y'all remember layaway? Y'all remember Kmart? And yeah, remember granny would put just a little something on it and all the way till Christmas she get it out. Right. They had to do away with the layaway because the saints don't be doing right. But that's here nor there. The Holy Spirit is our earnest, is our down payment. That's what you're feeling when you're feeling the goosebumps or thing. That's just a small taste of God's presence that we're going to be living in in eternity. Can somebody say hallelujah for that? So back to the gifts we have made. We've made the gifts the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And I, I don't know. I think we need to correct this. We've made the gifts, the evidence. When, when the Holy Spirit gives us the evidence, we say it's the evidence. Well, how do you have the Holy Spirit? Well, I have the evidence of speaking in tongues or I have the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yes, that is, but I think a better way to say it is that we have the Holy Spirit and we have the benefits of the Holy Spirit. Instead of the evidence, I think we have benefits in the Holy Spirit. You know, that that's how God shows us that Jesus is living in 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 and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. We have the evidence of the Holy Spirit. So I have the Holy Spirit with the benefits of speaking in tongues, with the benefits of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a difference. There are evidence you, you can say that there are evidences that you can show that the Holy Spirit is operating in your life. I'll just give you a few. First evidence is that you experience help or comfort of the Holy Spirit. It, you experience the comfort or just divine help. And this is found in John 14, 16. If you take in notes, I got side references for you. John 14, 16 says that the Holy Spirit is a comforter or a helper. Have you ever been through a heavy season or a grieving season or a mourning season or a time you really needed help and you feel this, this divine help, this divine presence of the Holy Spirit that helps you get through it, that takes the weight of it. You don't even feel the full impact of it. That's an evidence of the Holy Spirit. Also, the Holy Spirit, another evidence is that the Holy Spirit gives you power to witness, power to be a witness for, for him. And that comes from Acts 1 and 8. Power to be witness. God will give you a boldness. God will put put uh, words in your mouth that you didn't even know of. This is the power or evidence of the Holy Spirit. Another evidence that we skip over a lot. But if you want to know if you have the evidence of the Holy Spirit, it's the fruit of the spirit. This is found in Galatians 522. The fruit, fruit, what is fruit? When you go to the grocery store, you go get fruit. Fruit is evidence. Fruit is tangible. Fruit is something you can hold in your hand. It's not like mental. I think I'm eating an apple. No, you have an apple, right? This is fruit. It comes from a tree. It comes from a process. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You want to know if the Holy Spirit is operating in your life. This is the evidence. And, you know, a lot of times we make it more about the shout. We make it more about the dance. We make it more about the gifts. And really, these are the evidences that we should look at. What, how do we express to other people? Are we expressing the fruit of the Holy Spirit? And then the last one, I, there's so many. There's, I'm just going to give a, 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 a last one of an evidence is that the Holy Spirit will always point us to Jesus. Did you know that? That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's one of the Holy Spirit's job is to point us to Jesus. And this is in John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit's job is to glorify or to point us to Jesus. So every time Jesus is highlighted in your heart or in your mind, that's the Holy Spirit highlighting and pointing you to Jesus. So Galatians 5, 16 tells us that we are to walk in the spirit. So I want to know, how do we walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh? How do we walk out Pentecost? We've been talking about Pentecost this over, these, over all these weeks. How do we walk it out? Walk it out. Walk it out. How do we walk out? How do we live Pentecost? So this is not just this ethereal thing that we're talking about. How do we really live it and walk it out? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm so glad that you want to know because it's so important that Pentecost is just not expressed at home and it's not just expressed in the church, but it needs to be expressed in the world. So this brings us to our main text for today. Our main text comes again from 2 Corinthians 5, and I'm going to look at verse 13 through 15 right now, and we're going to walk through each verse. Y'all y'all good? Y'all got time? Y'all want to walk through? We're going to just walk through each verse. I love taking it line by line. So let's just look at, we're going to start with verse 13. We're in 2 Corinthians 5. We're looking at verse 13. This is Paul. Paul's talking to this crazy church called Corinth, loaded, uh, located in a, a place called Corinth. They are the Corinthian church, and they are off the hook, y'all. They, they, you know, they remind us of our everyday church. They got a little bit of everything going on, and they had a little controversy. So Paul had to come, and call, Paul was coming with the clapbacks and the check marks. So let's just look at what Paul was saying in verse 13. It says, if it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. See, Paul had to come and set some things straight because the Corinthians was looking at him a little funny because, you know, there are other people coming uh, with a false gospel and they had this spectacular fog machines and lights and music and all kind of things. And they're looking at Paul a little sideways because Paul's writing letters from prison. It's like, bro, how's this working? Like they here and you're not like they're looking at crazy. They're looking at Paul like he crazy. And they're really looking at Paul sideways because his ministry was to the Gentiles and Jews wasn't really feeling that. Like they thought he was crazy to minister to the marginalized. They're like, Paul, what is going? So Paul was coming with the clap back was like, look, if it looks like I'm crazy, then that's just to the glory of God. And then if I'm in my right mind, y'all think I'm like all tamed and whatever. That's for your benefit, too. I have a question. I want to know what are you willing to look crazy for? What are you willing to look crazy for? Everyone might not understand your calling. Everybody might not understand who you're called to. And you got to learn to be okay with that. We got to learn to sit in that. Everybody don't understand your mission. Everybody doesn't understand your purpose. People will come to you and be like, oh, girl, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, because that's not your calling. This is how I could take it. God's put this in. Are you willing to look crazy or are you too concerned about your image or what's going on or how you look on IG? There's sometimes you got to look crazy for Christ. And Paul was like, look, if it looks like I'm crazy, then this to the glory of God, because I'm here and I'm going to do what God's called me to do. All right. So verse 14, it says either way, whether you think I'm crazy or you think I'm just, you know, out here being cool. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Christ's love controls us. Another version says Christ's love compels us. So we since we believe that Christ died for all, 
We also believe that we have all died to our old life. I love this because Paul says like, hey, either way, it's the it's the love of God that's motivating this. What controls your motives? Think about this for a minute. What is at the heart of your interaction with people? Are, are you are you when you're talking with people or navigating with people, is your goal to correct them or to set them straight or to, you know, get them to believe in your morals or your convictions? What is the motive of how you interact with people? Is it to correct them or is it to love them? Because Paul was like, you know what, even though Corinthian church, y'all out here acting a fool, I'm here and everything that I'm doing is is controlled by love. I'm not even trying to do too much. I'm not even trying. Everything comes from love. I lo we really got to think about our motives. What controls us? And what if that was our testimony that everything we did came from a spirit of love and it controls you. It takes over you. It's the main motivating force, as Aaliyah said, in our in our interactions with people. And then I love that it also says, since we believe that Christ died for all, I'm going to read that again. Since we believe Christ died for who? Since we believe Christ died for all. Christ died for all. How many people did Christ die for? How? I, I'm going to have to look at the chat later. Put it into how, how many people did Christ die for? It says that Christ died for all. I looked it up in the Greek. And you know what all means? It means all. Christ died for all. My question is, does our theology reflect all? Does your personal theology reflect all? Does your personal morals and convictions reflect the fact that Christ died for all? And if we believe that we have all died to our, our old life, we believe that we've all died to our own life. Guess what? We're all in the same boat. There's all means all and all means that we're all in the same category. And since we believe Christ for die for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. We've died. to. How many believe that you are dead to your old life? I'm talking about the you you were before you started following Christ. The hot mess you, the you that was just off the hook. Like how, how many people am I talking to? Do you believe that? You're, you have died to that old life or are we out here resuscitating zombies? Are you giving CPR to your old life? Because before you gave your life to God, your spirit was dead to God. And then when you follow Jesus and you invite Jesus into your life, the Holy Spirit comes in and breathes life and you have a new life. You have a new spirit. That's why you are born again. That old life is dead. The new life is here. And, but we steadily try to go back and get that old life and walk around with a corpse again. It is time for us to believe that Christ died for all. And since we believe that, we believe that we have also died to our old life. Somebody say my old life is dead and I'm not going to go into graveyards and digging it up anymore. I'm dead to that. Say I'm dead to that. OK, we're going to move to verse 15. Now, I got to tell you about verse 15. Verse 15, I know it's hard to like have a favorite verse in the Bible, but I think this is my favorite verse in the Bible. This is this is what I call my life verse. You know, back in the 80s, people, it was a thing to have a life verse. This is my life verse. I love this. But every time I hear this verse, it's like I get a, a punch in the stomach. Like I just it just does something to me. Verse 15, my favorite scripture. It says he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Oh, I love that so much. I love this verse because once you get a revelation of the magnitude of the love of Jesus, and everything that Jesus has done for you. 
And once you get a revelation of everything that Jesus went through to give you access to God, to fill you with his spirit, to bring you back from an old life to a new life, to give you a new purpose and something about it will make you say, I have no other response but to live my life for God. I no longer want to do things my way. I don't want to live selfishly anymore. I don't want to live in a place where I'm just living for me, my dreams, my goals, my car, my money, my all that. All that goes out the door when I get a revelation of who Jesus is and how much he loves me. It makes me want to say all I want to do is live my life for you. I don't want to do things my way anymore. I solely want to live for you. I promise you it's my favorite verse. There's no other response that I have than and to, to live my life for Christ. The one who died and the one who was raised. Um, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for him. Can I get an amen? So we just got these wonderful verses, right? We just went through like, oh, that's nice. Hercules, Hercules. Like these are really nice verses, right? So what is the conclusion of this? And this is where we're getting into the crux of them. And what is what is the conclusion of this? These are all nice words, Paul. Thank you for coming. We're going to send you the love offering in the mail. Like, thank you. What is the conclusion? How do you live this out? It would seem as though this could have been the end of the chapter. Great. Christ died for us. We need to act right and we need to get our lives together. Right. But instead, the culmination of this truth, it, it astounded me. I got to tell you, the next verse will surprise you. Is there, there's a plot twist to this story, and it's a, it has a very unexpected ending. I, I was shocked when I saw the culmination of this verse. How do we live? What does this look like practically? How can I live out Pentecost? It's in the next verse. It's verse 16. Look at what verse 16 says. It says, so we have stopped evaluating. Wait, 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 let me go back. It says, so, so, so the conclusion of everything I've just talked about. So, so, I do, I'm just, the conclusion of this. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. Verse 16 says, we have stopped evaluating people from a human point of view. At the conclusion of this matter, and after I've realized what Jesus has done for me and I want to live my life, this is how I'm going to live it out. I'm going to stop evaluating people from a human point of view. I'm going to stop evaluating people from a human point of view. Why? Because we're all in the same boat because Christ died for all and that all who believe in him have a new life. And so that means we're no longer just going to evaluate people based on their physical appearances, based on their age, based on their gender, based on their ethnicity. We're going to stop evaluating people from a human point of view. What a revolution it would be, especially in the church, if we stop evaluating people merely from a human point of view. Paul said, I'm not going to do it no more. After I get a revelation of who Jesus is, I'm changing. I got a new uh, way to evaluate people and I'm not going to do it according to a human point of view. This is so good to me because look at verse 16b. It says, at one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Paul's like, hey, we had it twisted before. See this, we, we're not going to evaluate people from a human point of view because we used to look at Christ. We used to have Jesus twisted. We used to have, we used to just look at Jesus from a human point of view. Now, what would be the problem of just seeing Jesus from a human point of view. A lot of people saw Jesus wrong. You know, he was born in the wrong neighborhood. He came, Jesus came from the hood. Jesus, many thought he was a false Messiah. 
because he can't be the real Messiah, because if he was the real Messiah, he would be here to overthrow Rome, our oppressors immediately. Like, what is this dude doing? Like, he can't be the real Messiah. This is from a human point of view. He hung out with people that most people shunned. Ain't no way he could be the Messiah hanging out with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors and out here going to banquets and, you know, just living it up like that can't be Jesus. That's how when people just see Jesus from a human point of view. And even today, most people are like, you know, Jesus was a great teacher and historical figure. You know, it is documented that he lived in on the earth. And, you know, that's about all he is a human point of view. Paul said, no, how differently we know him now. Paul said, we used to look at even Paul. Paul knew this was his testimony. Paul was out here persecuting Christians, killing Christians because he only saw Jesus from a human point of view. Who is this little cult leader and all these people following him? We got to get rid of them. He saw Jesus just from one view. But everybody has to have a moment if you're going to follow Jesus, where you see him differently. Have you had that moment? Have you had a moment where you see Jesus differently? Not from a human point of view, but from more of a spiritual point of view. Not what your grandmama told you. Not what your mama, your Sunday school teacher. Not what you got from Bible class or some televangelist. Not what you heard from others but that you've seen Jesus differently for yourself with your own experiences. You felt the love of God for yourself. You felt the touch of God. You read the scriptures and you believe that Jesus is who Jesus said he was, that he is the Messiah, that he is the savior of the world, that he is the Lord of Lord, that he is the King of King, that Jesus is the one who he said he is. Do you see Jesus differently? Have you had a moment when you see Jesus differently? So what does this all mean now? What does this mean for us? Verse 17 wraps it all up. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. I'm going to go back and say um, this verse one more time. It says this means if anyone. It, it says it, it, this means if anyone, if anyone, if anyone, how many people are anyone? I looked it up in the Greek. You know what anyone means in the Greek? It, it means anyone. If anyone is in Christ, belongs to Christ, the new person made in God's image just changes everything about our evaluation forms and how we see people and how we perceive people. Because if anyone could be in Christ and if Christ died for anybody and anybody can be saved, this changes everything. You will never look in the eyes of someone that Jesus doesn't love. You will never meet someone that Jesus didn't die for. We, you know, we all have some form of karyarchy. We have some form of karyarchy. And that comes, that, that, that just means that um, we are all privileged and we are all oppressors in some way. Karyarchy. We're all privileged and we are all oppressors in some way. And we have to check that all of us hold some form of privilege. And with the privilege that you have, we have to be careful not to oppress others with this privilege that you have, where you, where you stand in society. This is all made up societal stuff. But when we do have some type of privilege, even as people who are oppressed, we can have a hierarchy among oppressed people and use horizontal violence among each other. We have to check that. We have to do the work we're asking the, our society to do. We, we have to do the work that we're asking white supremacy to do. We have to check these things in our hearts and our minds and not oppress those among us with our own 
privilege. If you whatever privilege you have, it is up to us to get power away and to love and to reach out to those who might not have the same privilege that the society views that everyone should have, because we are trying to get everyone from the margins into the center. Can I get an amen? So in my conclusion, now we have a new evaluation process. And with the new evaluation, you guys you know at work, anyone get like an annual evaluation? So sometimes if you're like on and you're popping, like with the new evaluation, you get a promotion. And with a new promotion, you get a new job description. So congratulations to everyone who is listening. You now got a new evaluation. You got a new promotion. And now you have a new job description. I'm going to tell you what your job description is. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Follow along with me so you can know your new role. It says, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors making God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, hallelujah, who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Brothers and sisters, we now have a new job description. We are now ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are now reconcilers to the world. And if you go to any foreign embassy or any place that they have um, ambassadors throughout the world. It is your job as an ambassador to represent your country. You're not there doing your own thing, making your own rules. Doing, you are to follow the protocol and everything of the country that sent you. Same with us. We are representing heaven. We are representing God. And we have a responsibility to reach out to those around us. Why? Because so many people have been turned off to God because of church people, church politics, toxic theology. So many people have been turned off from God. So many people think that God hates them. So many people think that they are doomed to hell. There's so, so many people who think this. And this is um, a point that we just really need to take a time and just recognize and just really take some time to say like our, to our LGBTQ and plus brothers and sisters, our siblings, this community really should be commended because they built a whole movement based on love. Think about it, a whole movement that's going worldwide based on love. And that should be the church's message. They have led the way. They have actually paved the way and showed a model that we should be following as the church to build a whole, a whole movement just based on love. And then whenever I get an opportunity, I always want to just say like to, to just give a heartfelt apology on behalf of everything that people have gone through on behalf of the church and of just toxic theology. I am so sorry for everything that people have had to endure because our movement should have been controlled and should have been compelled by love. That's why we are saying, come back to God, come back to God. We're going out to the margin saying, Hey, come back to God. God loves you. It's so important. The way you see Jesus is how you will treat other people. Your view of Jesus is going to really show how much you treat people. If you see Jesus as this hard authoritarian with thunderbolts in his pocket, ready to strike somebody at any time, that are just ready to send people to hell, that's how you're going to treat people. But if your view of Jesus is that Jesus is a liberator, 
and that Jesus loves those in the margin and Jesus is here with open arms to hang out and to love on people who are usually shunned, then that's how we should mirror. We should mirror that form of Jesus on the earth. I'm going to close with this. And I think as a result of this, our heart and our prayer, our prayer should be, God, I want to see people the way you see them. God, I want your heart for people. God, give me your eyes. Show me what you see in people. And God, use me to bring people back to you. Holy Spirit, let me see it different. Let me see it differently. I think a lot of us, including myself, we need a whole new evaluation form on how we deal with people and how we reach out with the gospel. <laughs> we have to have a heart that Jesus has. We're reconciling people back to God. This is, what, this is our prayer for today. And I just want to close with a word of prayer. And I'm hoping that all that was said in this message, that you would just walk away knowing that we have to change the way we see people and we have to look at people and let them experience new life in Christ. That is for everybody. So many people don't want to coach. They don't think they have the right church clothes. You know, hey, I'm dealing with addictions. I'm dealing with problems. You know, I, I've been caught up in the, in, in the drug, drug wars. I've been caught up in the prison systems. I might have I murdered somebody. I've been prostituting. I've been from all of these things. People don't feel like they could come back to God. This is our job. This is our job as the way that we will say, come back to God. He's already made the way. All you have to do is accept Jesus. So God, we just want to take this time to lay down all our old evaluation forms. God, we just want to take time to repent. We're, we're sorry for how we've seen it. We're sorry for all the times that we've gotten it wrong. Lord, we want your perspective. We want to see it differently now. We want to see you high and lifted up. We want to feel your heart and your love towards us. And we want to give that to other people. God, use us. If that's you, can you just lift your hands wherever you are and just say, God, use me. I want you to use me in this way. God, give me a new perspective. Give me a new heart. Give me new eyes to see people the way you see them. And if you're even here as we're still praying and you want to know this God that we're talking about, can you just take a moment and just repeat after me? And just say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. I want to uh, learn more about you. I ask you into my life. And I want to follow you all my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.